the video. <laughs> um, let's get let's get kind of loose here. <laughs> get ready to roll. Ready to roll. Okay, yeah. talking points real quick. So I'll do introductions first, okay. and then uh, we'll talk about like how this idea came out, okay. and then we'll talk about your like your podcast. On a we'll pimp that, <laughs> and then we'll start with talking points, and then you have your talking. Yep, points. I do. Let me pull those up real quick. Okay. <laughs> I don't have talking points. <laughs> I have. A, I'm a, I where am I supposed notes. to have it at? No. Oh no, I have a few You just statistics. made it. Oh, okay. I yeah. just have some just to, yeah, uh, just start to have talk with the wind. <laughs> All right. I remember casual conversation. Yeah. Okay. All ready? Right. All right. No, I'm ready. All right. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Real Talk with me, your host Aaron Bragg. Um today's podcast is gonna be a little bit different. I have a couple wonderful guests with me. Um, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanna, and I am a woman in technology. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I've spent about 10 years of my career working with a lot of men. So as you can imagine, I have a lot to say. <laughs> True, we didn't talk about the subject. We'll talk about the subject in a minute after the introductions. No, 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 it's not your fault. Yeah. So, hi, my name is Kim. I'm a cybersecurity professional at a large software company. I've been with them for 20 years. Uh, I've been in the industry for going on 30 years. That's a long time. Uh, and I have some unique perspectives on how we've evolved in the IT profession in terms of diversity over the years. True, because I did this one a little bit backwards. Normally, I talk about what today's topic is, but I was so excited to have multiple guests <laughs> that I jumped right back at, right into introductions and didn't talk about the topic. Today's topic is uh, diversity inclusion in the cybersecurity industry. So how this idea for this podcast came out is I had uh, talked to you, I think it was two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and we're going to pause for a moment and we're going to do a promotion. We're here at Railtown, so if you hear some background music, this is Railtown Brewery in Dutton, Michigan, some of the best microbrew in Southeast Michigan. It's pretty uh, good. So we were, we were having a discussion about the upcoming CloudCon GR because I reached out to both of you because you had done a post mm -hmm. um, on LinkedIn that was very informative and kind of a little bit of an eye opener for me. And then you recently did a um, workshop, not a workshop, but panel. a presentation. Yeah, panel for the local chapter of the ISSA mm -hmm. um, with, it was you and Curtis, right? Yep. Curtis White, hello Curtis out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard you guys, you guys knocked it out of the park. So Thank while um, the CSA board members and I were thinking about different tracks for leadership, we went through a whole bunch of different iterations of ideas, and one of the big ones that kind of stuck out to us was uh, diversion and inclusion in, you know, in the current state, and how do we help leaders become more diverse, mm -hmm. and more open-minded, yeah. you know, things like that. So then fast forward to our conversation two weeks ago, you guys said thank you, or not thank you, but yes, <laughs> you'll, you'll join the craziness of CloudCon. Um, and then we kind of just casually talked about what you guys were going to talk about. And it really opened up a broader conversation to where I was enlightened and educated. So that's something I kind of want to do again tonight is I, I know we can't recreate that exact moment, mm -hmm. but I think there was great talking points mm -hmm. on that that we brought up where you both, I was your guinea pig, right? I am, I am a middle, soon to be, sorry, not quite yet. As <laughs> people, people in the audience are looking at me right now. <laughs> I'll soon to be middle-aged uh, white man and obviously the cybersecurity industry. And it really, it didn't shock me, but it, like I said, it was eye-opening. So um, let's talk about that initial conversation and how you, how you came about with the first presentation at ISSA. How was, how did that come about? Um, so I got, uh, Apple, um, reached out to me. Apple is the president of ISSA and I used to be the president of ISSA for two years. And, uh, prior to that, I was the membership director. And so I planned several events over the years for them. Uh, but Apple had reached out and she said, hey, would you like to do 
this panel and it was oh that's interesting because it's a crowd that i'm comfortable with and uh to be on the other side of sitting at the front and talking about it but i've done several uh, diversity panels uh in the past so apple knew that i had that uh background Experience, i also yeah. used to be the president of women in technology at davenport that's where I know Apple from originally before she became president of ISSA. So, um, yeah, she put together the ideas and what they were thinking about. And I said, absolutely, I would do it. And that was that. So, For those that don't know, Apple's real name is Aphrodite Jones. Yes, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> you would not find her on LinkedIn if you, <laughs> if, you searched, if you searched Apple on LinkedIn, you'd find a lot different results. Yes. So. <laughs> um, and then my other esteemed colleague. Yeah. So um, we first got connected when I posted an article about diversity in the cybersecurity workforce on LinkedIn. Um, that article was really about how we will have a shortage in 2021 by about three and a half million security professionals. And the fact that we're not really taking a look at, uh, you know, we're not really doing the best job that we could around hiring people, not only in terms of their diversity and whether it be race or gender, but also their diversity of thought. And so that article really spoke to a lot of the facts that I think that we're going to talk about today. Excellent. Well, we'll talk in more general sense because we still want the, you know, we still want our leadership track to be <laughs> successful. So yeah. make sure you don't spill too many beans I won't, today. I promise. But uh, before we jump into the next topic, the diversity of the thought that were really was something I didn't think about mm -hmm. too much until we had our conversation a couple weeks ago, you know, cause I did, you know, it's going to sound naive, but I did think of diversity as gender specific or race specific, mm -hmm. it, like your thoughts on diversity of thought really kind of got my eyes opened a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you and I had, let's start things off with you used a resume example when you were trying to give me examples about different ways that guys, well, not guy, not just guys, but yeah. I mean, I, we're going to pick on me today. So <laughs> me, you know, a white middle-aged guy, you use the resume example as a little bit of an eye opener to me. Do you want to kind of talk about what we talked about with that? Because I I'm a former general manager of a major restaurant chain, so I would have been in that situation and maybe even inadvertently had that thought at one time. So let's talk about your resume example. Oh, uh, I'm not entirely sure which resume example, but I think it was uh, the names. The, the, names. the names. That's what I was the thinking. Names yeah. With the resume. Yeah. yeah. So for resumes, right? You have this unconscious bias, and you think you get a resume and it has a name we're just going to use Shaniqua for example my mm -hmm. apologies Shaniqua if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> and you don't necessarily have anything against the black woman working on your team mm -hmm. but all of a sudden you see that resume and you're like Shaniqua oh that's just she could just be rough on the edges mm -hmm. and I don't know if I'm ready for a person with that personality that type of personality and that is unconscious bias. It, and you don't even look at the rest of it. You read it over and you know you see um, uh, Joanna Smith. Yeah, I like that. Joanna Smith. And you're like, oh yeah, that sounds like a yeah. simpler uh, person to deal with. But we're prejudging people before even knowing. But we also know, even though you weren't thinking about a black woman, you also know that that name is associated to a black woman. That's, yep. how, that's where you got that idea that they might be too difficult to work with. And all of a sudden, you're not even interviewing her. You're interviewing other people. And then you go out and you're like, well, I don't ever get any black women applying. Well, no, they did. <laughs> you yeah. missed it because they had a weird name. Well, a name you thought was weird. Yeah. So. And when she may, in fact, been the most qualified candidate. Yeah. But before she ever even had a chance to open her mouth and step in the door, she was disqualified and discredited. She yeah. And chance. that one kind of I think that one hit home to me a little bit because as a former restaurant manager, I may have been looking to fill mm -hmm. specific roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I've worked even in restaurants in Detroit. So when you say a subconscious, it wasn't it really was a subconscious thing. But I might be like, oh, I'm not looking for, you know, an outgoing um, <laughs> server today. I might be looking for like, you know, like a host, you know. A yeah. hostess yep. coming across that res or, you know that job application i would have been like oh you know what i really need somebody that's not going to be challenging at the hostess stand you know 
all those things would have went through my head as mm -hmm. opposed to maybe like a bartender position or something like that. And those are things I, you know, we, I think we've even brought into like the IT and security industry. So Absolutely. that really was an eye opener to me. And, it, and in some cases, it's something as simple as, oh, well, the customers are going to have a hard time pronouncing this name, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, we have a lot of complicated names out there. Like nobody ever yeah. <laughs> uh, lost the job over it, but people do. It's a real thing that happens. And, and, and it goes beyond names too. It, yeah. it can go to someone who comes in and has several tattoos. Yes. Or maybe a nose piercing. Or, or pink hair. Or pink hair. <laughs> and you judge them the second you see them. But they might be one of the smartest people you ever met in your life. But we just, it's that bias. And we're trained. We're trained from early on to have that bias. It's something that we have to untrain ourselves. They actually have training around unconscious bias. Yeah. Um, obviously, later on, we're going to talk about how to change our mm -hmm. whole thought process. Yeah. But let's, you know, we're at the beginning of the podcast. So let's talk about root cause so to speak mm -hmm. is that something that you think is going is it exacerbated with social media nowadays or is it getting better because of social media i feel that it's a mixed bag i feel that people are becoming more open but i feel that there's also contingents where people are holding on to the old days so mm -hmm. i think social media has brought to light this yes. unconscious bias yeah. but i don't think it's necessarily solved the problem quite yet I think it's definitely improved it because mm -hmm. um, you've seen scenarios where people have gotten fired over a stupid thing that they said um, on social media. Yeah. But I also don't think that people are more uh, racist or more biased or more sexist or whatever you want to say today than they used to be. I think that social media is just like really brought it out and the, pe the people you thought were just normal people and they start talking and posting stuff and you're like, whoa, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just- We're not po talking politics in this but I may yeah, or no, may not like I may or may not have friends that I unfriended <laughs> after their true colors have come out so to speak yeah. no I'm just kidding um Kim let's dive into a situation and you can go as little or deep as you want I'm an open book. <laughs> <laughs> but another thing where like again was a really eye-opener for me as it was for you is you talked about your observations on mm -hmm. a trip to Chicago so yeah. again go as yeah go yeah, as shallow absolutely. or as deep as you want with that yeah. but I mean to me it was a really power it was a really powerful thing for me to hear yeah so um, once upon a time I was married to a man and uh, you know we did this is all the same you know heterosexual white people things that you do you know you go to a restaurant and the server brings the man the bill right well, I um, uncovered later in life that there was someone that I really fell in love with, and it was a woman. And we are happily married today. Uh, but when we first started dating, uh, we were in Chicago, and we held hands walking down the street. Is I thought nothing of it. Um, you know, she was my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. And uh, we were approached by a group of guys who uh, teased us and made fun of us and wanted to take pictures of us and said things that were rather inappropriate. And it was the first time that my eyes were opened in terms of what it must like to be someone else who's judged instantly based on their looks, whether it's a person of color or maybe they, a religious symbol that they happen to be wearing. Um, that was the first time for me that I really said, wow, I now know what it's like to walk down the street and be judged before anyone even gets to know you, even knows what your name is. Right. Um, and so that was a situation that definitely opened my eyes, especially for people of color. Yeah. Absolutely. It's hard. <laughs> like I have to continue talking after that. And that yeah. was that was obviously that was deep because it just shows that anybody mm -hmm. can be affected like at a, you know at any time with something yeah. like that. So, what are some of the other examples out there that you've kind of ran into mm -hmm. in the IT industry and even yeah. in the cybersecurity industry? Because before we can before before I have you answer because. I'm fortunate enough, I'm four years into cybersecurity, 10 years into IT in general, mm -hmm. and I've been fortunate enough for the companies that I've worked with, I didn't realize were, were pretty you know laid back about that. And especially recently with the West Michigan area and a, a, an unnamed brewery in the area getting themselves <laughs> in trouble with not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. We've been fortunate enough to our, our leadership with our current employer 
that has been proactive long before like it was a thing. So I haven't been exposed to this in IT and security like other people. Because again, our leadership is very fortunate. We have a we have a pretty it's at our location. I almost said where we're at. Uh, <laughs> we have a really good like a really good mix, and I'm very proud of our my current leadership for handling that. So I these are all new things to me. Mm -hmm. So what other you know before we talk into that, like how the how we need to change things? What are other examples that maybe somebody like that me hasn't thought about like in the especially in it and cybersecurity so i was going to ask you a question um, uh oh here we go <laughs> <laughs> would you have even noticed that there was a problem or there wasn't a problem regardless of your leadership because again as a white male um a lot of those things could still be happening and you just don't know because it's not affecting you Ooh. So how would you have known otherwise? I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't lie. If, if the things wouldn't happen at that local brewer or the initiative yeah. that our new CEO hadn't thought about like a year ago. So let me pause for a minute. In my current role, I get exposed to a lot of projects and ideas before they even come to, uh, come to fruition the normal public so some things yeah. that we're talking about now haven't been done yet at our healthcare system but they're in process so had i not had i not been exposed to those things had i known there wouldn't be a bigger problem i got, I got i'm not gonna lie no mm -hmm. i probably would have been naive i probably would have looked around you know i'm fortunate enough i work with curtis you know he's a little bit younger than me but he's <laughs> super intelligent african-american man like conversation wise no big deal we have you know we have a couple um uh, indian engineers on our team like we have a pretty good you know diversity so i wouldn't have second guessed until you you know until you talked about stuff like right. this I'm, I'm gonna give you sorry no, i'm gonna no. give you two examples real quick one example that's not related to me at all um i recently this is very recent uh, we have an area where a lot of, um, I hate to say this, but a lot of Indians that are contractors sit at. Mm -hmm. And because they know each other well, they speak the language. And I literally heard a white man say, um, I forget what we're talking about, and I was describing something, and he said, oh, yeah, over by the call center. And that right there, our engineers, they are not call centers. Okay. Wow. And this oh, yeah. white male assumed that because there are this group of Indians sitting together that they were running a call center and they're all like senior engineers. Yeah. And I like took like two so I was like, that that's not the call center. What are you talking about? I was like, well, what did those guys do all day? And I was yeah. like, I fix Unconscious them. bias. Like, unconscious bias. He didn't mean to. <laughs> it's just something that your brain is uh, set to do, you know, mm -hmm. you thought call centers with people with accents and this and that, like that's all you knew about it. Yeah. And and I thought, and that was so recent, I was like, oh my God, like it's 2020 coming people. <laughs> 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 and then my second example is uh, way back in the day, I used to be a desktop support uh, technician. And so I would go into oh, um, different areas to fix computer issues and second level support. And I, I can count, I can't even count how many times I went in and the customer would literally be like, they sent you, like, I need somebody that mm -hmm. knows what they're doing. And yeah. like, I haven't even started yet. It's not like I have been sitting wow. here for two hours mm -hmm. trying to get it done. Like I just walked in the line. Don't you have anybody else that can take care of this for me? Uh, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm all you got. <laughs> and then, but once I got that thing taken care of, now they want to be BFFs. So yeah. like, oh, wow, like you knew how to had that problem for a while. And, but they didn't even give me a chance, right? So like you have to, I have to have this thick skin because I can't take, it, can't take it personally. It's, it's what your brain is programmed to do. But, you know, how far do you take it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had the same experience as being a young woman, being in my... 20s, mid to late 20s, working in IT, I had a very specific skill set, one that was pretty rare, 
Um, so I would walk in a meeting and I would start talking about my particular skill set and you would see it was almost entirely men in the room and I'm mostly white, but, um, you know, that's a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, woman. And, and I typically was the only woman in the room and you could see their physical posture where they would cross their arms and sit back in their chair and raise their eyebrows and look at me. And it, I, this happened in every meeting back then. It happens far less now, but back then I had to prove myself. It took me the first 10 minutes of every meeting with a new account, with a new client, to prove that I knew exactly what I was talking about. Um, so it made it really uncomfortable. And I even tried to dye my hair once, and that didn't work. They still didn't take me seriously. So. <laughs> what, do, what color do you Lucky, do? I was going to say, brown. Oh, oh I was going to okay. say, you didn't go crazy and do don't like pink or anything. <laughs> no, I didn't do pink. I thought if it was dark brown, maybe they'd take me seriously, but it didn't okay. work. Someone recently posted something on LinkedIn, though, and they said that there is this um, belief that a professional white woman that I never thought of uh, has to actually be blonde. Mm -hmm. And she said, I've been coloring my hair blonde for years because um, that's just what people are used to. And I can't ever wear my natural color, which is like a brunette. Yeah. I was like, all right, I did not think about that. And back then, well, I'm a little older, but back then, blonde jokes were a thing. So that's where it all came from. Uh, enough of that. So, so uh, we've we've matured in certain things. Yes, so to a degree. we've got some great conversations, like getting into the meat of this and more like talking about aha moments mm -hmm. for me because mm -hmm. I was a guinea pig, right? Like yeah. used me to, as an enlightening moment. Uh, one of the things that gave me that aha moment was a couple months ago. Well, not a couple months ago. It's only been a month and a half. Um, I did a workshop, uh, security business analysts, or sorry, business analysts is hidden security champions with Megan, who happened who happened to be here when we were having this conversation. And we kind of walked through some things. And my aha moment was around where we had spent a couple lunches. We worked really hard on this presentation. And in my head, I wanted, you know, I've done these before, but I, you know, this is her trying to build her personal security brand. Yeah. I wanted her to knock it out of the park. So it's one of those things where subconsciously I said, hey, I'm going to be wearing this outfit. You know, this is business analyst, going to be casual conversations, but I'm still wearing this. Are you going to wear your glasses and wear your hair back? You know, and you and it's funny because Meg, Megan looked funny. Meg, Megan looked at me and like I remember that, and you both looked yes. at me like, yeah. Aaron, don't. <laughs> what don't. were you thinking? Yeah. But it was an aha moment for me because yeah. I was looking, I was looking that situation. I'm like, I want her, people to take her seriously, yeah. right? To your point, yeah. blonde, you know, blonde hair. Yeah. I wanted people to hear, you know, what she said even more seriously than normal because she's trying to build a personal security brand. And I didn't realize that just saying, hey, I want you to look like a librarian yeah. was, you know, was a bad thing because that wasn't that wasn't where it was coming from. Right. Yeah, like right. I I wanted her. We spent, you know, we spent three or four good lunches walking through that, really trying to drive home the example. Mm -hmm. We met with my former CISO, Lenny, and gave us great feedback. And I really wanted to knock that workshop workshop out of the park. Yeah. So that's where it's coming from. Yeah. But I, mm -hmm. I literally didn't look at it as like, wow, I just subconsciously wanted you to look like a librarian so that everybody that's in that room is going to take you seriously. Yeah. And that was a really powerful moment for me. And I, like I said, between the Shaniqua <laughs> resume one and that example, I literally was like, wow, OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you know. were coming from a helpful place. And I feel like that is the thing that um, uh, I want to say I read an article about it as well. But people have talked about allies um, mm -hmm. wanting to so into the diversity thing. They want to really help out. But they say some things and you're like, I, I see where you're coming from. But like, that's literally the problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. So instead of you taking me, uh, telling Megan to put her glasses on, you should watch for those people that aren't taking her seriously as an ally. Yes. What you can do is make them take her seriously, not tell her to change who she is so that other people can accept her. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does make sense um, because we need to work harder. And like you said, with the allies, we need to work harder to accept people for who they are and their backgrounds and their cultures. Uh, and again, it goes to whether your clothes you're wearing or maybe a religious artifact that you're wearing. It should be you should be accepted for who you are and taken seriously. 
and a way for people to speak up and say, you know, rather than telling them to wear their glasses, maybe you say, oh, Megan, that's a great point. You've, you know, you've done X, Y, and Z, and it's been so beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. And then that's a way to back her up and give her credibility in front of the room rather than making her feel like, um, geez, I'm not wearing my glasses. They're not going to take me seriously. So, <laughs> And if people are talking over her, you can like pause Step them up. and yeah. say, you know, Megan is still talking. Can we listen for a minute? Yeah. That is the way to support um, the cause. Yeah. Because um, that's one of the things that women have all the time, whether it's black or uh, yes, uh, like, white yeah. or whatever color, is as a woman in a room filled with men, the men want to do all the talking. Competitive and, talking. Yeah, and it's like, oh, hi, I'm, I'm still talking over here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Do, I mean, see, as a Alpha type male. A person, <laughs> oh, my God, this, this is going to be a therapy session. I apologize <laughs> to everybody listening, and this is why we picked an unorthodox place to do this, so I could have a beer and relax a little bit. Um, on a serious note, though, so... Let's talk a little bit more about the how we can change mm -hmm. because we're in this weird spot and I can feel I can feel it and I hope that others can feel it where where change is coming, whether we like it or not. I mean, yes, yes we have a giant there, there's diversity in financial stuff. There's diversity in ethnic, you know, race and gender and everything else. But it just feels, you know, in my lifetime that the change is going to happen, yeah, whether so. you like it or not. And we're totally going to leave current politics out of this. <laughs> right. But I mean, but it comes into play a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is a giant power struggle going on in many different areas. And then the problem is, is IT is um, kind of like we t I talked about in previous podcasts. IT is a smaller subset of the overall business oh yeah so now you have information security which is an even smaller subs you know a smaller subset of a small subset of the business besides being like a champion or an ally what are things that we can do now in information security not as a, not in a leadership role because you're going to talk about that in your mm -hmm. workshop, but like just with with me, like an everyday, like an everyday person, like I'm literally looking around right now, and the people watching YouTube will see this, but I have an awesome, intelligent programmer over here. But guess what? He's a middle-aged white guy. Yeah. <laughs> I have my sound engineer that's also a security engineer, <laughs> and guess what? He's a younger, yeah, you know, white guy. So. What are the things that we need to do to start mm -hmm. programming ourselves so that it starts from the ground up? Because, yes, you're going to do a workshop. You're going to help leaders understand right. more. But I think I think that has to be a groundswell with us yeah. as guys and especially, you know, white guys. Not to sound yeah. cheesy, but I mean white guys. So because we still have that residual influence over a lot of areas in IT and especially cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So like, what can, what can we do besides being an ally? Um, I I'll go first. Mm -hmm. um, I would say where I work, uh, our new CEO has been in office for about five years and he's really made a huge transformation in our company. And he's done that through leading with empathy. That is really his, if you want to say his personal motto, that's number one, lead with empathy. Uh, he is a special needs son, I think, which has made him a very I empathetic did not know person. that. I did not know that. Yeah. I learned something he new. He does. <laughs> and so he you know, has a huge focus on empathy and what people's stories are. And making sure that people are fair and he's made a few mistakes in terms of diversity and inclusion himself on stage publicly uh, he's come out and apologized he's um, put a big emphasis on it across the board from a leadership perspective but I want to get back to that word empathy I think if you lead with empathy everything else follows um, you know uh, people listening to this podcast white men black men whoever people listening to this probably have children or nieces or nephews Think about your children, your nieces or your nephews, um, all the young people in your life, in terms of how you feel about them. If you have a child and your child gets hurt, you have empathy for them. You want to put a Band-Aid on them and give them a little kiss and a hug, right? 
We don't have to do that with our coworkers. Please don't. That's probably inappropriate. <laughs> However, yeah, no kissing. Lead, with, yeah, lead with that same empathetic soul. You know, when you see a young person, whether it's a young woman of color or, a, you know, just a, a youthful person or someone who has a different mindset or a different background, lead with empathy. How must they feel in this meeting? Mm -hmm. And what can I do to elevate them to their potential? Because they do have potential. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the room. Yeah, I can agree. You guys to are gonna that. give me a little, uh, <laughs> a little, a I'm a little verklempt. <laughs> I can totally agree with that, but uh, and it it really still goes back to just being an ally and mm -hmm. a champion ultimately, uh, because you have that privilege, so you can stand up for them when they cannot stand up for mm -hmm. themselves. They already know what this workplace is like. They don't need reminders um, of what it really means to work with all men. They know that already. So what you can do is create a welcoming environment where they feel heard and they are looked at on like what they can do, right? Um, what they can do, not how they look or how they go about it. You, uh, Cause this is not where you're just praising people that do terrible work, right? That's not where we're going at. It's they do good work. Um, but a lot of times we miss that. Nobody brings up the fact that this person has been the top performer on their team time and time and time again. And every time they say something, they still have to prove themselves, even though they've proven themselves like 500 times already. So making that environment welcoming and treating them just like you treat all the other white male, right? They're not fragile. They're not going to break. They're not a glass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, they are regular human beings that can do the job, and we should give them the same. Um, not privilege was the word that I'm looking respect. for. <laughs> respect. The same Empathy, respect. respect. Exactly. Yeah. So they what did you... People. So, from me. Think it from an HR point of view because I want this to be a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you? I mean, so what did you do in that situation? You said uh, the situation you talked about with the with the Indian engineers and the call center. How um, did you? You did. How did you? Did you try and remediate the situation? Yeah, I, that, I told that guy right there. Then I was like, no, like they are not call centers, and I joke about it, and I'm very sarcastic. So I was like. Did you, you say call sarcastic? center because the <laughs> I was like, did you say call oh, center no. because they're Indians? And everybody laughed. I was like, no, like that's a serious <laughs> question. And he's like, no, I didn't even think about that. I'm like, oh yeah, obviously, because a group of white guys is sitting over there talking and laughing all the time, and nobody ever called them a call center before. Uh, and so we sort of, uh, and he was like, oh, I guess I didn't realize what they do, whatever. I'm assuming that it wasn't like a big. They didn't even hear it, right? So, but I made sure that I let that person know that wasn't right and mm -hmm. that was not acceptable. And I tried to do that if I hear somebody um, say something about someone that I always was sort of step in and whether that is jokingly or <laughs> seriously, but I feel like that's what we need to do for each other. Um, Cause again, if it's unconscious bias, they'll never change unless somebody else has points them out. What, have you ever had a time where you've tried to change that behavior and it's not gone as intended and how did you handle that yeah. like where they were just basically like i don't i don't care and how do we handle that well so when i would oh again when i was doing tech support um i had a particular case where a person said they weren't they didn't want me fixing this stuff. They wanted somebody else and they demanded that my manager give them somebody else. And they just didn't have time to go over this and have to go over this again when they have to bring in another person. And at that point, my manager was an ally. And uh, when they sent, she called him, he was like, well, it's the best of God. Um, you either want your work done or you don't want your work done. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So, Do you want it fixed or yeah, not? <laughs> good luck to you. And uh, so the, the person grudgingly uh, let me do that. Again, there would have been a different scenario with a different manager who would go, okay, you know what, just to avoid the conflict, I'm just going to give you somebody else. Um, but my manager wasn't that person. So in that case, he was my ally. Uh, and he gave me that opportunity and that person grudgingly did it, but he was happy overall because when he was, I was like, and then every time he would call me, it's like, Hey, can you help me with, so I was yeah. like, hey. but to be your best, I meant to be always, your best friend now. Yeah. I would yeah. always joke about that and I'll go, 
what really are you sure you don't want somebody else <laughs> <laughs> uh, but and again it's really your attitude right it's not like i was running around throwing my hands up in the air and crying about it yeah. <laughs> um, but i was still positive about it and so in the end it worked out but it doesn't always work out and sometimes you have to go cry and that's okay go cry <laughs> how about you Nish? Well, a time you know, where you wanted it to work but it didn't work out you know i would say um it, it, there, there's a, a variety of times where it hasn't worked out, but I would just like to say something that I've learned recently is that it's a systemic problem in the corporate world uh, in terms of passive aggressiveness, right? So Joanna had a choice after this incident happened. She could have called him out on the carpet right there in the lunchroom and said, you know, she had the choice to say, those are senior engineers. Or she could have left the room and she could have gone and talked to all of her other coworkers, all of her friends, and yeah. said, oh my gosh, can yeah. you believe this guy and what a jerk he is that he <laughs> assumed this, that, or the other thing? Right. So I think that this has happened to me recently. I've been in some situations and a coworker called me up and had a, an incident and said, I don't understand why I got into this argument with another person. And, you know, there was some there was some diversity things in there, but I was point blank. I gave him constructive criticism. And I told him, I said, you know, this isn't comfortable for me to tell you these things, but in order for us to both grow, we have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So changing that culture and that mindset takes each and every one of us, whether we're a diverse person or whether we're a middle-aged white man, we have to just be good to each other and provide that constructive feedback and let that person take it from there. Wow. All right. Um, a couple more things as we wind things down here. Um, we talked about the process on what, what's needed to make the change. Um, Let's wrap things up a little bit with, can you talk about a high, a high level preview? Give us a sneak peek of what you two are thinking about if you had to hit, when you do the work, leadership workshop. Because it's, it's a whole different mentality, right? right? To your point, you talked about your current CEO making mistakes and trying to learn from them. Like, how are you, give us a sneak peek of how you get leaders that might be on the fence because mm -hmm. you brought it up earlier. Some people aren't going to change. You're right. going to, you're going to have, you might have executive leadership of that workshop that just might be there to check a box. Yeah. You might only have five people there, but they might be five influential leaders, right? right. Like how are you going to, how are you going to present to on a, on a, on such an important topic where there might be five leaders in that room mm -hmm. or there might be 35, you know, we don't, right. we don't know. We'll know when that, when cloud kind of happens in May, <laughs> <laughs> um, how many people? So what, yeah. what high level leaders, what do you, what do you want to give them a sneak peek on? Well, as I mentioned in the start of the podcast, by year 2021, 20, uh, we're going to be about three and a half million people short in the cybersecurity workforce. Right. And why does that hurt you? How does that hurt you? I mean, we're talking about money here. So let's start out first and foremost as to why you care. And that is because financial um, reasons are out there as to why hackers do what they do today. It used to be, oh yeah, you get a virus on your computer and it's a pain. Nowadays, it's very lucrative to be a hacker and they can take millions of dollars from your company. CEOs can get fired nowadays and sometimes even face jail time. And so we need the best and brightest minds. So we need those leaders to stand up and listen to the why you need diversity in the cybersecurity workforce, and then ways to make that happen. There's a lot of good techniques out there where we can start looking in ways that we never thought possible. One little sneak peek tidbit is let's talk about the military veterans out there. Those guys have been out in the field fighting and defending attacks and the real world, real attacks that cost people lives. Those people know about attacks and they know how to defend against them. Let's put them in the cybersecurity world and let them do their thing only with technology. So there's a lot that we can do and there's reasons why we need to do it. So let's talk about that. And that's, I think, what Joanna and I are going to get to in our session. And I'll, Joanna, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Uh, I'm a big fan of hit them where it hurts. Yeah. Uh <laughs> <laughs> the pocketbooks. Yes, all, all leaders love it when you yeah. hit them in the pocketbook. Yeah. Hit them where it hurts. So it's all great. Obviously, I would love for leaders to hire people because they genuinely believe um, that in diversity of thoughts and that it will be great and all of that. But no, like seriously, you're leaving money on the table. Mm -hmm. You need those people. And we can't keep talking about 
all this, oh, there's going to be so many people that we need to fill jobs. There's so many bodies out there looking for work. You're just looking for a very specific person. You're not looking, you're looking at for a, a middle-aged white man with a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity, right? In the meantime, there is a Hispanic woman that has customer service experience and a very analytical mind that she just doesn't know what she can mm -hmm. apply it to yet. Um, so because you can't check boxes, you overlook your resumes and all of that. Uh, but what they will bring to the table, your person with a bachelor's degree in computer science isn't bringing it to the table and we have to start looking in different places because as more of the other jobs get automated out those people will be out of work and they can do this work that is a good point because one of the th personal things i'm going to try and do in 2020 is is you know there's data security and cloud security strategy but i'm actually going to personally on the side start looking into understanding ai machine learning better mm -hmm. for that particular part because i need to understand how the business is going to use AI. And I'm not talking about like, you know, security tools that are going to use AI. It's going to magically replace blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm not talking about it like that. I think in the security space, to your point, we need to understand how the business wants to, wants to use AI, wants to use machine learning, wants to use analytics so that we can then better understand how to, how to protect it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Maybe we do, and I'm, you know, I'm looking internally here, looking internally at myself, at myself <laughs> internally, something, something like okay, that. Inside your soul. <laughs> Fortunately, I've only had one beer. Otherwise, I really would have made an ass out of myself. Um, where we change that thought process on who we hire, right? Because maybe it is, maybe I need to pause for a moment, and if all of a sudden I magically become a, a director of information security or something look at that person that might be a marketing person that's heavy into like Salesforce or something like that or like Microsoft Azure and you know what maybe their experience might not be in security but they're understanding analytics they're understanding the ins and outs and how the business is going to move forward and then help them be business or security bilingual and understand their thought process so that example of you know uh, Hispanic woman with the associate's degree with a great customer experience. I mean, I guess it hits home with yeah. me because I wasn't tradition. I didn't come into security in a traditional sense. I came in in a round roundabout way. So, yeah. And there are we've had nurses that have uh, become IT people, mm -hmm. and they come with a whole different set of experience. They know how hard it was to do certain tasks. They know the things they do often, and they bring really good ideas where they're like, no, it sucks that this does this all the time because as a nurse, when I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z, it would be better if I could do it this other way. And that is a thought that I, as an engineer, would never have because yep. I've yeah. never had yep. to be on that other side doing that yep. work. Yeah. Um, so anybody and everybody can do this job. Excellent. All right, so we need to finish up because I try and keep it around the half an hour mark yeah. so I don't put anybody to sleep. I don't think this podcast is going to put anybody to sleep. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to you too. Um, so how can listeners learn more about diversity and inclusion? And then what I'll do for the people on the, on the YouTube, I'll put different links to these if you want to send me like, yeah. oh, we need to put, the don't let me per forget to put your a link to your article okay. that was awesome on LinkedIn. But how, as we finish up here, how can people learn more about diversity and inclusion? Um, there's actually, if you just go and do a search on cybersecurity diversity, you'll find a an, an wealth of uh, information out there uh, that you can follow. Um, I'll also provide you some links. There's a great book out there. It's an e-book about the top 100 women in the cybersecurity workforce. Uh, that is very enlightening from all different companies and backgrounds. Uh, so really just uh, through CloudCon, when we have the event, that'll be a great start. And uh, just go from there, do some searching, do some research, talk to us, reach out to us. I'd love to talk to anyone further about the topic. 
Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and for me, I just recently started a thing. Uh, it's called Bridges in Tech. Yep. Oh. Sorry. We, I almost <laughs> forgot. I apologize. So I'm going to, you know, just um, do this for myself. <laughs> um, but Bridges in Tech is really about creating awareness um, of, about diversity in technology, but also providing resources for the people that are looking to get into the technology field or people that are already in the field and looking for ways to advance themselves and get to that next level. So if you go to bridgesintech.com, you can find a whole lot of information on there. I usually would also post some articles that I find interesting um, on there. So yeah, that's uh, I, that would be a great start to get all your diversity mm. stories and needs. Well, excellent. It's almost perfect time in there. We're winding this down because you can tell dinner time is coming and it sounds like business <laughs> is picking up. But I thank you very, very much for joining me today. And I thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. So thank you for having us. Yes, all right. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Anybody